probably get going. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Holly Fernandez Lynch. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics um, in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy here at Penn. And I'm the organizer along with Steve Joffe of the Research Ethics and Policy Series or REPS. Um, and today we're excited to welcome Dr. David Fagenbaum on the ethics of self-experimentation, fairness of resource allocation across rare diseases and other ethics and policy issues that will reflect on his own personal journey across um, and research on Castleman disease. Just a quick note and reminder that REPS lectures continue to be recorded and we post the recordings on our department's website as soon as they're ready. So you can capture that resource later on. A couple of quick announcements. Um, those of you who are reps regulars probably have these memorized by now, but we always have new people joining us. So bear with me for just a moment. First, you should see on the screen right now, the full lineup of reps for the rest of the year. Um, we always end up having to swap some things around uh, if people's schedules change, but this is the current, um, the current slate. Um, and you can find out a bit more about the topics and um, bios for these uh, speakers on the department events webpage, which I think Mary has posted in the chat. And then just please remember that registration is required individually for each session. Okay, um, then just a quick reminder about some of the online resources from our department. We have um, a series of faculty videos on ethics policy and COVID-19, which we've been periodically updating. And then we also have a series of short research ethics courses that are available for free continuing education credit. And we'll be adding just a couple of more over the next few months, um, including research with vulnerable populations and research in global settings. And Mary can make sure there's a link to those in the chat as well. So with that, let me just um, thanks again to our co-sponsors who make reps possible, uh, along with Mary Pham for her always excellent uh, administrative assistance. And I will go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Dr. David Fagenbaum is an assistant professor of medicine here at Penn, where he's associate director of patient impact for Penn's Orphan Disease Center, founding director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory, and executive director of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. He's also a patient battling idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, and he's the author of a book called Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. And David, I meant to tell you this, you can um, let your publisher know that the algorithm is working because I googled you for your bio and now I'm seeing your book uh, on, on all outlets, so they should be happy about that. Um, Dr. Fagenbaum is thankfully in his longest ever remission due to a precision treatment that he identified that had never been previously used for his disease. The innovative approach that Dr. Fagenbaum has spearheaded now has been highlighted as a model for rare disease research, and he's applying it in the context of COVID-19. So we're really excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for, for those of you who are um, listening in, our plan is to save about 15 minutes at the end of the lecture for questions and discussion. Um, as we go along, please feel free to post questions in the chat, um, and then I will read them off um, when we get to the when we get to that point of the session. Okay, I will stop sharing my slides and turn things over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Holly, for that introduction. Um, it's it's really an honor to be with all of you today. Of course, wish we, we could all be in person um, and, and certainly wish there wasn't this um, this snowstorm and, and, and obviously this this pandemic that's raging, um, but really uh, thrilled to get the opportunity to, to share um, my journey and some of the bioethical challenges and dilemmas that I've faced. And hopefully these will give you guys some insights into some of the, in some of the uh, bioethical, bioethical challenges that you all um, are thinking about in your day-to-day -day -day work. So I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen. Great, so my, my talk is titled Self-Experimentation and Rare Disease Research, Lessons Learned from Chasing My Cure. And I think it'll become um, pretty clear throughout my talk as to, as to why that is. I just wanted to give a couple disclosures that I received research funding from Janssen Pharmaceuticals and Yusuf Pharma and study drug for a trial that I run. I thought that I would begin my talk by trying to um, pull, uh, I guess, summarize my journey in, in five photos, and then I will dive deeper and deeper um, into each part and some of the ethical challenges that arose. So um, this is a picture of my mom and I shortly after I began my freshman year of college. She had just been diagnosed with brain cancer, and the experience of her being diagnosed with brain cancer and 
um, watching her battle over the next year before she eventually passed away is what motivated me and inspired me to want to go into medicine. I promised her that I would dedicate my life to trying to find treatments for, for diseases like, uh, like brain cancer, which, which took her life. So fast forward a few years um, to when I was a healthy third year medical student here at Penn, where I was training to become an oncologist to treat patients like my mom and to advance research. Uh, when out of nowhere, um, I became a critically ill patient myself. I um, was hospitalized in the intensive care unit at Penn, and I spent months in critical condition um, before eventually receiving a diagnosis of a very rare disease um, that I would soon learn um, was likely to kill me if I didn't um, identify a drug that could help to save my life. And um, that's when I became a researcher and began searching for a treatment that, that could potentially save my life and others. Uh, but realized that it wasn't something I could do on my own. It would need to require a collaborative effort working with physicians, researchers, patients together um, so that we could advance uh, research and treatments um, as part of a community. So during my talk today, I'm going to dive further into each of those five uh, aspects of my life, certainly of my journey. Um, I plan to highlight um, some of the challenges in rare disease research uh, from a from a bioethical perspective of, of uh, focusing um, on these are rare conditions, um, but they actually, when combined, uh, affect a significant portion uh, of the population. Talk about self-experimentation. There certainly um, are a number of notable examples. I'll, I'll talk about a couple in the Castleman space and finally close with some future directions. Let's see, sorry, click one more slide ahead. So um, I wanna start um, back when I was in the ICU. So this stage, as I mentioned, I was a third year medical student and out of nowhere, I began feeling intense fatigue, um, abdominal pain. I noticed uh, lumps in my neck um, that turned out to be enlarged lymph nodes and um, began feeling worse and worse every day and eventually went to the emergency department just down, um, down, the, down the hall from where I was taking a medical school exam and they ran a series of blood tests and determined that my liver, my kidneys, and my bone marrow were all shutting down. And so they hospitalized me and within a couple of days transferred me to the intensive care unit. As I, as I progressed rapidly, I had a retinal hemorrhage that made me blind temporarily in my left eye. I required uh, dialysis three times a week, needed daily uh, blood transfusions um, to keep me in, out of critical zones. And became more and more sick every day um, due to an undiagnosed condition. We didn't know what it was. Um, it ended up taking about 11 weeks to make the diagnosis. But in, in the midst of that, at, at the lowest point, um, no diagnosis. And um, the doctors uh, encouraged my family to, to say their goodbyes to me. And um, I, I obviously, uh, that was uh, one of the most difficult experiences of my life, saying goodbye to the people that I loved. And there was a moment um, uh, the following day that I consider kind of the, the lowest point uh, for me. And, and, and this talk you'll notice is, is really a hybrid between a very academic, but also very much to a personal talk. So I'm probably a little bit different from, um, from maybe some of the others, but um, I, I did want to share, I mean, this is a very human story. And I think that all, all that we do, it, there's, there's patients on the other side of it. So, um, so I, I did want to kind of um, uh, go, go maybe in some places that, that, that wouldn't typically um, maybe come up during an academic talk, but at, at my very lowest point, um, I remember um, really wanting to give up and feeling that, um, that I, I didn't have much time left. Uh, you know, maybe I had a couple of days of life left, but, um, but, you know, I certainly didn't have much of a future. And, uh, and I, and I remember there was this split second where I, I looked at the, the telephone cord uh, next to my hospital bed. And for just, it was maybe just half a second, I thought to myself, maybe, um, maybe the couple of days of suffering I have ahead of me could all be relieved if, you know, if I just reach over and, and grab that telephone cord. Um, thankfully, uh, that, that, idea that thought was fleeting. And um, thankfully, I, you know, I went back and said, you know, I've got to keep, keep pushing, keep fighting, keep, um, you know, keep fighting for each breath. Um, and, and I did. And um, uh, unfortunately, I continued to, to get worse and worse. <clears throat> But, but obviously I, I did not die, thankfully. Um, around that time, um, my dad got a phone number of an NIH doctor and um, was calling him every day to, to give him updates on what was going on in my case. And, um, and, and he would listen to my dad for about 30 minutes a day and, and give, give my dad his thoughts on what to do. And um, eventually about six months later, I got out of the hospital and uh, I asked my dad, I said, dad, 
who is that doctor that you were calling every day at the NIH? Um, uh, you know, I, you talk to him every day for 30 to 45 minutes. Who, who was this doctor that was kind of advising you and helping us? He said, um, I don't know. I think his name's Fuchi. You should Google him. And so, so I Googled um, Fuchi and, and I learned that, um, that Dr. Tony Fauci was actually advising my dad daily um, for 30 to 45 minutes throughout the course of multiple weeks um, of my illness. And um, of course, uh, Dr. Fauci has um, become a very prominent figure now, but at that stage, he'd already won a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And so my, my dad absolutely sh should have known who he was. Um, but I think that it, 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 this is an anecdote I wanted to share mainly um, to highlight you know, how far family um, will go for the people we love. And my dad literally was hounding an NIH director daily. Um, and, and thankfully, um, you know, he was willing to, to accept his calls. So at, at my lowest point, I just want to highlight a few um, passages throughout this talk. The lowest point, um, I wanted to give up, um, uh, but thankfully survived. I've really considered that, that moment to, to really be the start of a sense of overtime. So um, in overtime, this is an experience of intense awareness and scrutiny and clarity. There's a reason for that. When there are only a few seconds left on the board, all distractions disappear and the purpose of victory becomes clear. The present is only the things around you and overtime is all present nothing but present and purpose. And um, this sense of overtime is something that I've, I've really had and felt uh, where there's, there's real clarity around, um, around how to spend the limited time we have. Thankfully, um, right around that, that time when, when actually a priest came in and read my last rites to me, um, we got the diagnosis. So this is my lymph node, um, which a pathologist looked at and said, this looks like idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. Um, IMCD is a, is a rare condition. Um, there are only a couple thousand of us diagnosed each year in the US. And um, IMCD really kind of sits on the, the line between an autoimmune condition and a lymphoma. There's features of both, and we actually don't know what category to put it in. Um, unfortunately, about a third of us will die within five years of diagnosis, and another third will die within 10 years of diagnosis. Um, so it's, it's a very um, a serious condition that, um, unfortunately, uh, at the time, um, really chemotherapy was the only option. So, so I was given uh, multi-agent chemotherapy, uh, which saved my life. And you can see uh, my dad and I sitting up um, uh, just thankful uh, that, that I'm alive. Um, this is about five months into my disease course. Um, and then this is a picture of my dad and I on New Year's Eve. Um, so just about a week after the picture on the left. And you can see that I'm bald from the chemo and um, I've got this huge belly from all the liver and kidney failure that I was experiencing. And um, my dad and I took a walk that night around the hematology oncology floor about 8 p.m. on New Year's Eve. And we saw that there was a gentleman who was clearly drunk on New Year's Eve. He was kind of like swaying in his chair. And on our next lap around, we saw that this gentleman had fallen onto the ground. And so my dad ran over to him and helped him back into his chair. And he looked at my dad and I, and he said, thanks so much. Good luck to you and your wife. I said, wife, what is he talking about? And then I looked down at my belly and I realized that he thought that I was my dad's pregnant wife and that we were walking laps, you know, to deliver our, our child together, um, uh, which was a low point emotionally <laughs> for both of us. But I turned to my dad, I said, man, dad, you've got an ugly wife. And, uh, and we laughed really, really hard. We, we managed to laugh in the midst of, um, you know, what could have been um, a, a really, really tough time. And, and this, I think, um, certainly uh, doesn't touch on too many uh, bioethical issues, but I, but I do think that it's an important concept that I wanted to highlight, that facing my horrible moments with laughter was just as fundamentally a rejection of Castleman's dominion over me as anything else I was doing. It cleared my mind, it stiffened my resolve. It was entirely up to me to determine what was and what wasn't funny. Perhaps most important, humor is social. For me and my family, there was never a better way to reset our collective resolve than laughing together. And I think that many of us that are struggling throughout this pandemic can, can appreciate the importance of laughing with the people that we love. So this is a picture of me when I got out of the hospital and um, you can see maybe how someone would have confused me as my father's pregnant wife. And um, this is a picture from a few years before. I, I played college football at Georgetown. And I always say that this is like the worst before and after picture of all time. But if we could flip the order, it would be this like great advertisement for Peloton or for, for Muscle Milk. Um, but unfortunately, um, the pictures are in the wrong order. Although I did take a picture every week for eight weeks. And you can see um, my hair starting to grow back. And you can see my belly um, starting to go away. Um, when I got out of the hospital, um, 
uh, there was one thing that I had regretted a lot while I was in the hospital, and that's that um, my girlfriend, uh, before I got sick, and I had broken up um, shortly before I became ill, and um, and I kind of vowed to myself that um, that that I would never again, um, you know, want something which is for us to date and not not fight for it, or at least not um, or or at least not do something about it or try to do something about it. And and thankfully, Caitlin felt the same way, so um, we started dating again. This is um, us at our first Halloween. Um, a after um, I got out of the hospital and you can see I'm dressed as Borat. And um, this is another picture of the two of us from just a few weeks later. And um, this is actually one of my favorite pictures. I think it's really representative of, of where we were and, and, and maybe how, where, where I am today. And that's that on one shoulder I had, I was receiving an experimental drug, a drug called Sultuximab, um, the only drug to ever undergo a randomized control trial for my condition. Um, I, got on, I got the drug. Um, I was hopeful it was going to keep me in remission. So on one shoulder, I'm getting this experimental drug. And on my other shoulder is Caitlin um, that's supporting me. And I think that this is just very representative of, of my journey. I'm mentioning this experimental drug, um, Siltuximab. And um, of course, uh, this uh, was something that we were so thankful that there was a drug in development for rare disease like Castleman's. 95% of the 7,000 rare diseases do not have a single FDA approved therapy and the majority of them don't have any randomized controlled trials underway. So I, I consider myself very fortunate um, that the rare disease that I have happened to have a randomized controlled trial underway of a very promising agent. And I was very hopeful that it was gonna keep me in remission. Um, uh, during this remission, um, I ended up uh, writing up my case as a case report in JAMA Dermatology, which I think probably has its own uh, bioethical um, issues associated with it. But um, I, I had found that these blood moles were appearing on my chest and shoulders in the weeks and months leading up to um, my first presentation. And um, my doctors, rightfully so, um, you know, were not really very concerned about these blood moles. Um, um, but it was so strange because with each relapse, and at this stage, this was my, my I had had three, um, these blood moles got bigger when I got sicker and they shrunk when I got treatment. And so they felt like they were an important clinical observation. Um, and so we wrote, we wrote this report up and unfortunately um, quickly learned that many other patients um, experience what we call cherry hemangiomatosis, um, which, which I think is, is just, just highlights, I, I think the importance of the patient voice. Um, certainly it wasn't something any of my doctors uh, put too much weight into or, or were very concerned about and something I, I probably wouldn't have put too much weight into, you know, I was experiencing multi-organ failure. So, you know, who cares about blood moles? But I do think that it's, um, it highlights that the, the patient voice, you know, really needs to be included in, in our care. Unfortunately, I relapsed on that experimental drug um, and that's when I, I, I promised my dad, my sisters, and, and my girlfriend, Caitlin, that I would dedicate my life to trying to find a drug that could be useful um, in my disease. And, and when I said that, I, I knew that a new drug development was very, very unlikely. I knew that um, developing something from scratch was, was, was likely impossible, too expensive, too much time. Um, you know, where would I even have started as a third year med student? So my goal at that time, my singular focus, which I think is, is probably a a reasonable um, approach to think about uh, across rare disease, a singular focus became what is going on in my immune cells that causes this immune hyperactivation and multi-organ failure? What is going on in those cells and what drugs are already FDA approved that can potentially reverse whatever we're finding is wrong within my cells? What could we repurpose for Castleman disease? And so I started conducting lab research and started a foundation called the Calcium Disease Collaborative Network and, and joined the faculty five years ago, where I now run a center at Penn called the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory, focused on Castleman's and related conditions. But the, the important lesson here is that, is that hope um, really can't be a passive concept. It's a choice and a force. Hoping for something takes more than casting out a wish to the universe and waiting for it to occur. Hope should inspire action. When it does inspire action in medicine and science, that hope can become a reality beyond our wildest dreams. So at this stage, it was about turning hope into action, hoping that I could find something um, and then taking action to try to find it. So where were we back in, um, in, in 2012 um, for Castleman disease? Well, there's about $10,000 a year being spent on translational research for Castleman's. The NIH had never given a single grant um, towards IMCD research. There was no registry. There were two advocacy groups, but there was no sort of central research plan, no cell lines, no animal models, no diagnostic criteria, no treatment guidelines, no predictive biomarkers to say if you're if you have a particular profile, you're more likely to benefit from one chemotherapy versus another. Um, no FDA approved treatments. 
Um, and there was one drug in development, but that one drug in development did not work for me. And so um, it was a really concerning landscape. And this is actually the typical landscape for rare diseases. Um, you know, when we, when we think about rare diseases, maybe some of us think about diseases like ALS um, that have a lot of public awareness, or maybe you think of a rare disease that you know someone um, personally has or someone you've treated. Um, the reality is there are 7,000 rare diseases that affect 30 million Americans. Um, and of those 7,000 rare diseases, like I said, only about 5% have an approved treatment. So this is the landscape for most rare diseases. It's not cystic fibrosis. That's, that's an exception. Um, it's not even really ALS, it's somewhat of an exception as well. But this is a landscape, no money, no organization, um, no guidelines. Um, and, and so thankfully there's, there's guidelines for a lot of rare diseases, but, but no money, no organization, I think is pretty uniform. So I wanted to share a little bit about Castleman disease, um, uh, just to give a bit more of a, a framework as we think about some of these bioethical challenges. So um, Castleman's had been well characterized what was happening in patients, but it was, it was years later before we actually figured out why our immune systems were getting highly activated, or at least what was happening in our immune systems. Um, Kazu Yoshizaki, um, a researcher in Japan, discovered that interleukin-6, which is an important cytokine in the immune response, was very elevated in Castleman's patients. And he hypothesized that maybe if we block this one cytokine, this one inflammatory molecule, that we could stop the cytokine storm. Um, even with that idea in place, we still didn't know where, where the IL-6 was coming from, what was leading to the excess IL-6 production, which cell types were doing that, what was the etiology. Um, but Kazu did develop a drug called tocilizumab that blocks the receptor for IL-6 and siltuximab um, was later developed, which blocks IL-6 directly, where he was able to show that about a third of people, if you block the receptor for IL-6 got better. So it almost doesn't really matter, you know, why interleukin-6 is elevated if blocking it actually makes you better. Um, but the real problem is, is that for about two thirds of people, blocking interleukin-6 doesn't work. And so that's where you have no idea where to go and, and what to do next. Because the one thing we thought we knew about the disease um, actually isn't the case. So for patients like me that don't respond to this IL-6 blocker, um, we get multi-agent chemotherapy. Um, this is a picture of, of me and Kazu and, um, I think this is where we start getting into some of the interesting stuff with uh, self-experimentation. So Kazu made the discovery that IL-6 was elevated in Castleman disease. Um, he developed a drug that blocks the receptor for interleukin-6. He showed in, in a mouse model that um, he was able to reverse what looked like Castleman disease in these mice with this IL-6 receptor blocker. And when he was getting ready to launch a phase one study of tocilizumab in Japan, um, he was very nervous uh, to give it to humans. This is in the 90s before monoclonal antibodies were, um, were often used. Um, uh, I think there was maybe, uh, there's one drug that, that's very much uh, ahead of this one, but, but very little experience. So Kazu gave the drug to himself. Kazu Yoshizaki was the first human to receive tocilizumab. He doesn't have Castleman disease. He's, he's a healthy physician scientist, but he felt this ethical obligation, or I don't know if... Uh, ethical is the right term, but he felt an obligation to give it to himself first to prove that it wouldn't cause some, or at least not really prove, but at least to show in an N of one that it didn't cause some horrific side effect. And he took it. And when he didn't have any problems, then he proceeded the appropriate way towards a phase one study of tocilizumab. This drug went on to get approved in Japan for Castleman disease. It went on to get approved here in the United States for rheumatoid arthritis. And many of you all are likely familiar with the story of Emily Whitehead. She was the first pediatric patient to ever receive CART therapy. Um, and she experienced a cytokine storm very similar to what happens in Castleman disease. And she was very sick in the intensive care unit at CHOP. And her doctors decided to treat her with tocilizumab, this drug that Kazu had developed 20 years before for Castleman disease, the same drug he tested on himself they gave it to Emily Whitehead and it saved her life. And not only um, did it save her life, and which of course means so much for her and her family, um, but it also likely saved the entire CART therapy program for you know, potentially um, a decade or more of delay if, um, if the first pediatric patient had died receiving this drug. And this is an important lesson, not just from the self-experimentation piece, and this is not me saying that we should all self-experiment with experimental drugs before we give them to, to humans, um, but it's to highlight that drugs developed for rare diseases can often have outsized impact um, for more common diseases. And as you think about the ethics of resource allocation for rare diseases, um, we have to recognize that it's oftentimes not just the rare disease that, that will benefit from this research and development. Um, 
case in point is that um, uh, when COVID uh, erupted about a year ago, um, many doctors started using tocilizumab. And unfortunately, um, there was a lot of kind of anecdotal excitement that it was going to be effective for everyone. Turns out that some of the large RCTs or the large RCTs have failed to demonstrate a benefit. But more recently, it looks like if you give tocilizumab or a drug like it, cerilumab, within 24 hours of admission to the ICU, it looks like you can improve outcomes. And so it's it, the, the challenge with COVID is it's all about timing, um, but it looks like there is a benefit for this drug that caused to develop for Castleman's um, even within uh, COVID patients. So I wanna take a little bit of time just to talk about rare disease um, research generally um, and how I think you guys can think, uh, think much more critically than I can, um, but around um, how to do this in, in the most uh, appropriate way. How do, you, how do you distribute resources appropriately? So the, the traditional way that rare disease research happens, I mean, we, we know that large funding bodies like the NIH, those bodies, they do fund specific rare diseases. However, um, a very, very small fraction of all rare diseases receive significant government funding. So the vast majority, I think it's over 70% of rare disease research is funded by private, by individuals through private foundations. So so this is really the, the main framework that I think we all have to think about when we think about rare disease research, because this is the primary way rare disease research progresses. And that is that patients and family members raise money personally through grassroots efforts. Then foundations will put out what are called requests for proposals, um, asking for the best applicants to use the money that was raised. And, and of that, of the whole disease field, a fraction of the field will apply for the funding. So let's say there's a huge, uh, a big field, a rare disease field with 100 researchers. Let's say 10 of them will apply for funding. And then out of those 10, a smaller fraction will, um, will actually receive the funding. Um, then they move forward with doing the research and, and every six months or 12 months or whatever it may be, a new request for proposal is placed. And this sort of approach um, really, uh, relies on there being a small number of individuals who are the, 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 the best people in the world at doing the research and also the most likely people have a good research idea. And you're in a position where you're kind of hoping the right researcher applies for the right project at the right time. And as you know, if you have all these things uh, that have to line up, sometimes they do line up and sometimes there are big breakthroughs for rare diseases. Um, but as we shared before, we're not doing so great in the sense that only 5% of all rare diseases have an approved drug. So we have to think about this, in my opinion, a little differently. So for Castleman disease, we, we created this new approach called the collaborative network approach, where we started out by first um, building a community of physicians, researchers, and patients um, from within the Castleman disease field, but also um, related disease uh, fields. And then we sent out a series of surveys um, to the entire community asking what research questions would be important to patients, what research studies could answer those questions, and what researchers would be most qualified to do those studies. And it's from those questions that we were able to identify and prioritize research questions um, that were important. And then we could go out and proactively recruit the best researchers to do our, our research. So it's, an, it's, it's flipping from a reactive model where you're hoping the right researcher applies the right project at the right time to a proactive model where you figure out what is the right research question what it, and who is the right researcher. And then you go engage them and recruit them to actually do the research. Then you fundraise, depending on how much that project will cost. You also procure samples for those uh, researchers. You do the studies. And something we do that's really, I think, essential is focused around drug repurposing, saying based on what we're finding, what drugs are already FDA approved that could be repurposed. And then we disseminate that knowledge to our community and that creates a circuit um, for improved crowdsourcing. But we knew that we couldn't do it alone. Um, so we um, began to engage patients. Um, this is actually a, a castle man. I've got a, a castle man on my, my lapel or on my jacket. Um, uh, we've kind of repurposed the idea. Benjamin Castleman was the doctor who first described Castleman disease, but we've kind of repurposed the idea of a castle man into being a, a warrior. And we showed this to a bunch of patients during our first webinar. And then this showed up on our Facebook page. So one of our patients got it tattooed on his shoulder. And we always say, if this is not patient engagement, then we don't know what patient engagement is. But there is, you know, a real, there's a real effort within our community to engage patients, connect them into the work that we're doing. Um, and in more ways than just uh, webinars. Um, 
Uh, we also uh, turn to a large portion of the Penn community. So medical school classmates, business school classmates, grad students just generally at Penn um, who have been a part of building out this new approach to research that again, doesn't rely on just hoping that the right research applies to the right project, but really proactively does that. You can see we're doing our, our Castleman Flex. Um, we went around the world um, and it took about two years to, to really build a critical mass, but to get physicians and researchers worldwide connected through this online portal so they could all prioritize research studies. Um, you can visit um, our website, cdcn.org slash research, um, where you can see the status of all of our studies. I think that making data transparent so that anyone and everyone can see what's being done is, is really um, a, fun, uh, a fundamental um, uh, value that we have. Um, so I think, or I hope that that gives you a sense for um, a bit around the rare disease world and how disorganized it is and how there is very little order structure, very little, you could say even fairness um, to, to the rare disease space. It's, it's a bit of the wild west. And so we've tried to create some structure for the Castle disease field, but obviously uh, much more needs to be done um, across rare diseases. So now I want to talk a little bit more about self-experimentation. So I, I graduated from, from medical school um, in 2013, um, right after I had, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my fourth flare of the disease. And I enrolled in business school um, just down the street. And um, shortly after beginning business school, um, I had a relapse and um, nearly died for the fifth time from, from IMCD cytokine storm, ICU, really, really sick. Um, thankfully, chemotherapy saved my life uh, for the fifth time, um, but unfortunately, I was approaching the lifetime max of adromycin, and, um, and I also um, you know, knew that this sort of cadence of continued relapses and remissions just wasn't, wasn't tenable. So um, I knew that if I wanted to survive, I would need to find something that I could repurpose, and I knew that, um, that my doctors were, were out of options. So all drugs that had ever been tried for my disease um, had been tried on me, and none of them worked. And so um, the next step became, can we search for and identify a new approach that I could actually test um, to see if it could work for me? And so I had been running um, these cytokine panels where we're measuring uh, a series of proteins um, in my blood. And I've been running these panels in the, in the months leading up to my relapse. Um, and then I ended up in the hospital. Of course, I couldn't analyze any of them. But um, once I got out of the hospital, thanks to chemo, I went back to the, to the cytokine panel data and found that, that though almost all of my cytokines were elevated during um, my disease flare when I was in the hospital, only two of them began to rise in the weeks and the months leading up to my relapse. One of them is called VEGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor. The other one is soy volatile 2 receptor, which is a marker of T-cell activation. Those two proteins um, were rising um, in the months leading up to it, maybe suggesting that maybe they were involved in pathogenesis. Maybe T-cell activation, which is what um, soy volatile 2 receptor is a marker of, and, and blood vessel growth, which is what VEGF um, signals for, maybe they were somehow involved in pathogenesis. I had also stored samples on myself um, in, the, in the weeks leading up to my relapse and also during it. And I went back once I got out of the hospital and, and ran serum proteomics and also flow cytometry on the samples. And I was able to confirm that in fact, those two cytokines that we thought were interesting, um, they were in fact two of the most elevated cytokines when we looked across a thousand different proteins and they also um, uh, certainly marked increased T cell activation. And then I started thinking clinically, how does what I'm finding in the lab correlate with what happens in me clinically? And as I described at the beginning, um, Castleman disease um, is diagnosed based on lymph node features. And one of the key features of a Castleman's lymph node is increased blood vessel growth. And so blood vessel growth uh, would certainly correlate with an increased level of VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor. It leads to more blood vessel growth. So that was consistent. Um, I mentioned the cherry hemangiomas. They literally just blood vessels that were erupting on my skin. Um, that's just a dermatologic manifestation of elevated VEGF levels. So again, that fit. Um, and finally, the tremendous fluid accumulation that I experienced can also um, occur in the setting of elevated VEGF levels. And so the clinical picture was fitting some of what we were finding in the lab. And the question became, is there some sort of final common pathway that's involved in VEGF production, T cell activation, and some of the cytokines we're finding to be elevated. And um, I, I ran the proteomics data through a number of different pathway analyses tools. Um, and regardless of what um, tool we used, uh, the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR signaling pathway repeatedly was identified as being a, an enriched pathway. So maybe 
this pathway mTOR. So mTOR is really critical for T cell activation, for cellular proliferation, um, for cytokine production. Um, and so it, it certainly fit the bill that maybe the mTOR pathway based on this proteomic data and based on what we're seeing clinically um, could be important um, in my disease pathogenesis. And so I ran a really important experiment on my lymph node tissue. Um, and, and just thinking um, from the bioethical perspective, I actually had requested that this lymph node be resected during my, um, my last relapse with the hope that I could run experiments on it. If I survived, I wanted to have lymph node tissue that I could run experiments in the lab on. And I did survive. And so I went back to that lymph node and I ran a really simple immunohistochemistry experiment where basically you're looking for a marker of mTOR activation. And, and if that marker of mTOR activation called phospho 6 is, is present, then the, then the cell stains brown. If it's not, then it's a counter stain blue. So the more brown you see in the lymph node tissue, the more mTOR activation there is. And this is just a representative image of a normal lymph node. And you can see that there's certainly some mTOR activation. There's definitely some brown in a normal lymph node. Um, and then you look at my lymph node, and I didn't even have to look under the microscope. It was just so blatantly obvious. Um, just an incredible amount of mTOR activation in my lymph node tissue. So this didn't tell us that blocking mTOR would be effective, but it told us that it was a rational approach and that it certainly, there, there could be reason behind thinking about mTOR as being a central node and blocking it with a drug called serolimus, which has been around for decades. It was developed for kidney transplantation about 30 years ago, had never been used before for Castleman disease. Um, but we started testing it on me. And um, here you can see on the screen, I say that it's been um, 84.88 months um, that I've been in remission um, since I started treating myself uh, with this. And I, and I say that because I know that I can't round up. I don't know if I'm going to make it to 85 months in remission on this on this drug, but I also refuse to round down. I'm just you know, so thankful for every fraction um, of a month. Um, the New York Times called this Doctor Cure Thyself, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. I think it probably should be doctor helping himself a little bit right now and hopefully for a lot longer. Um, but importantly, uh, this did uh, give my wife and I the opportunity to, to get married. And um, I, I did just want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the, the decision to try this drug, um, to try serolimus. So serolimus has been around for decades. And um, at this stage, I had had multiple life-threatening relapses. None of the drugs that had ever been tried for my disease were working for me, and we were completely out of options. So either we try this drug that seemed to be um, at least uh, have a plausible mechanism that, you know, mTOR is up, this thing blocks mTOR, um, that's a good thing. But importantly, it also had very, a very well-described side effect profile. So I, I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew that it was unlikely or at least low likely that this was going to work. But I also had a pretty good sense that this drug is likely going to be something I can tolerate. And the, one of the good things about serolimus is that it's been around for so long and, and individuals who get kidney transplants, they're on it for the rest of their lives. So there's data on people being on it for decades at a time. So there's nice long-term data on this drug. Um, and uh, like I said, I was out of options. And so um, for me, it felt like a fairly straightforward um, decision. I didn't have too many alternatives. Um, I had, had a long conversation with, with my doctor. I shared all the data with him. And he felt that given the absence of other options that, that trying serolimus made sense. And now you can imagine that there's a lot of biases that can occur when you're both the, the researcher and, and the patient. There are things that you wanna see in the data that maybe will lead you to see something that's not really there. Um, and, and so knowing that, I, I spent a lot of time having a lot of other people reviewing the data, having a lot of other people looking at it in an unbiased way to try to make sure that I wasn't just seeing something I wanted to see. Because at the end of the day, it's the last thing I wanted, right? At the end of the day, I wanted to make sure I was seeing whatever was real. Um, and then eventually, uh, like I said, my, my doctor decided to, to give it a try and um, certainly didn't anticipate that, um, that this drug uh, you know, could be effective um, for as long as it has been. Um, during this remission, um, Caitlin and I had a daughter, Amelia. Um, this is our, our two-year-old, Amelia. Um, this is us uh, during Halloween, just a few um, couple months ago. This Amelia is dressed as Amelia Earhart, and we are her um, her aviation crew. Um, and during this remission, um, I've also, as I mentioned earlier, been able to go on to to start and lead the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory. 
um, here at Penn, which of course took on um, a, a new role when COVID erupted and we learned that the most severe cases of COVID experience a cytokine storm very similar to what we see in Castleman's. So we very quickly um, uh, redeployed a lot of our team towards um, COVID. We launched a project called the Corona Project, which you can access at the link on the screen, cdcn.org slash corona, which is uh, now the world's largest database of drugs being repurposed and used for COVID-19. It's amazing, over 400 different drugs have already been tried. Um, so in going from an N equals one, which is this drug helping me, we spent a lot of time thinking about, well, what about other Castleman's patients? So we published uh, a description of this discovery and the treatment of the first three patients ever with um, treated with serolimus. I, again, was the first author and also um, patient number one in, in the paper, um, which I think certainly has its own um, you know, ethical questions. Um, I disclose as part of my disclosures that I'm, I'm a patient. Um, uh, just so that way it's transparent. Um, we also went on to look at mTOR activation across a large cohort of Castleman's patients, so 26 patients, and we found that there was or there is significantly increased mTOR activation even along, even when you expand it to a larger cohort. Um, and, uh, and, and also this past year, we found a potential mechanism that could explain why there's increased mTOR activation um, in, in Castleman's patients. So based on our results, um, this drug's been given to other patients. I mentioned we, we wrote up the first three patients. Um, the first pediatric patient, Joey, um, showed up to Penn a couple years ago, and he was really struggling with, um, with a number of therapies. And, um, and the fact that he wasn't benefiting and kind of in light of our data, um, he was given serolimus and had a really, really positive response. He improved really um, quite impressively. And it was, it was, it was awesome to see. And he's, he's continued to do well for the last couple of years. Um, unfortunately, um, our anecdotal data from our registry suggests that about one third of our patients that have been given serolimus thus far will, will show some benefit. And we have a trial going on right now, um, but, but anecdotally, I can say it looks like about one third. Uh, unfortunately, there are patients like Lisa and Sergio who um, failed to respond to IL-6 blockade, failed to respond to um, chemotherapy, and, and unfortunately, serolimus was not able to help them either, and they passed away battling their Castleman disease. And so it's patients like Lisa and Sergio that we continue to push forward our work um, at full speed um, so that we can help them. In thinking about where we are today in 2021 from where we were in 2012 when we got started, um, we've raised about one and a half million dollars for Castleman's research um, through the foundation I mentioned. Um, and then that has led to an additional $10.1 million in additional funding from external sources. So about eleven and a half million dollars has been invested into Castleman's research, again, using our 1.4 seed funding to bring in additional funding. Um, my lab got the first um, NIH grant to study Castleman's a couple of years ago. We now have a registry with over 1,200 patients. And we have one collaborative network with a unified research agenda. We've got a biobank at Penn. Many questions still remain, um, but thankfully we now have diagnostic criteria, not only for my subtype of Castleman's, IMCD, but also for another uh, frequent uh, subtype of Castleman's called unicentric Castleman disease. Same thing with treatment guidelines. Um, we published uh, the first predictive biomarker ever. We actually have another set of biomarkers um, that are under review in a paper right now. Um, that drug, siltuximab, went on to get FDA approval. Um, and now we have two drugs in development, both the drug I'm on, serolimus, and another drug, ruxolitinib, um, that we also identified in my lab. Um, ruxolitinib is another one of these drugs already FDA approved um, with a very clear mechanism that we're excited about repurposing for Castleman's. So in our last couple of minutes, um, before I open up to questions, um, just wanna highlight um, what I think is a really important future direction. And that is on the screen, what I'm trying to highlight here is that on the right side of the screen, I'm trying to represent that there are about 10,000 human diseases. And on the left side of the screen, I'm trying to represent that there are about 2,500 FDA approved drugs. Those 2,500 FDA approved drugs are approved for about 3,000 of the 10,000 diseases. So the situation we're in right now is that our 2,500 approved drugs help about one quarter, maybe to one third of all human diseases, but two thirds to three quarters of all human diseases don't have a single FDA approved drug. However, there are certainly examples just like mine where one of those approved drugs, serolimus, is effective for another disease that no one has identified or thought of before. So I think there's an incredible imperative that we have, which is to say among the drugs that the FDA has approved to be safe and effective at something, we must do everything in our power to figure out what are all of the other things that those drugs can be helpful for. A perfect example is 
thalidomide. Thalidomide was initially developed for morning sickness and caused terrible problems in creating uh, awful birth defects in, 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 in young individuals. Years later, it was determined that thalidomide is a life-saving anti-cancer therapy used in multiple myeloma. That's one example. Viagra is another example where, of course, it was developed for one use. It's very effective for pulmonary hypertension and serolimus developed for kidney transplantation being used in Castleman's. These are just a few examples um, where, where, unfortunately, there just are not incentives in place to figure out all of the other examples. So I think there's uh, something that I'm very focused on, I, I'm now helping to, to direct an FDA public-private partnership fully focused on this idea of drug repurposing um, and hopeful um, you all will think about ways that we can um, both incentivize drug repurposing, but ensure that it's done in the most appropriate ways. I think we all saw, we've seen the, the good and the bad of repurposing with COVID. The the good is that there are drugs like dexamethasone and heparin, now tocilizumab in a small group, varicidinib in a small group of population, potentially colchicine, fluvoxamine, um, uh, and others that, that have clearly demonstrated some benefit. So we've seen the, the positive that drugs used for one thing can save COVID patients' lives. We've also seen the, the, the bad side of repurposing, which is drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which didn't, had not yet shown benefit in a randomized controlled trial were pushed as being effective therapies and eventually turned out to not be. So I, I'm hopeful that, that as a medical community, we can look at what's been successful, not successful from COVID and, and really apply this to other conditions. So I, this is my final slide um, that I just wanted to close with a few lessons. So the first is that there's incredible power when uh, patients can be a part of driving forward the research process. Another is this idea that hope can have many different forms. And, and the hope that I find to be most powerful is the hope um, that is transitioned into action. Um, another is that supporting others is often therapeutic. I think about my dad making those phone calls to Tony Fauci and doing anything he could um, to help me. And I think that this is an important lesson um, for all of us. Another one is that the power of laughter um, during the midst of really, really tough times. This is something that I'm, I'm really focused on this idea of solutions being uh, are hiding in plain sight and how can we make sure the drugs like serolimus are used in all ways that they could be effective. Um, I think the bottom line around self-experimentation is that it's complicated. Um, I certainly don't have any sort of um, bioethical frameworks upon which I looked at these decisions and I hope that maybe we can discuss some of those things during the Q&A. Um, but I can tell you in my case and, and also in Kazu's case, um, we you know, both uh, had an objective in front of us. And, um, and, and for me, I, I didn't see too many alternatives. I think Kazu, there, there are alternatives. You, know, you just do a phase one trial like everyone else does it. But I do think that in my case, um, that I was out of other options and that's what led to, to this decision. Um, I think it's important for doctors to communicate our limits um, to our patients. Um, my doctor telling me that there were no more options really led me to try to, to get involved. Um, we have to accelerate rare, rare disease research, and part of that, in, in my opinion, requires changing the way rare disease research is done. Um, I think it's important to have uh, a quarterback or, or an organizer that's involved in facilitating these connections. And the last, uh, last lesson I just want to highlight is that it really takes all hands on deck. Uh, my book's called Chasing My Cure, but it really should have been called Chasing Our Cures because um, it really has been um, uh, a, a huge team effort. And these are just a few of the many people um, that have been a part of it. So I think we've got about 10 minutes left for questions and I would just be thrilled to hear you all's thoughts, questions, comments. Um, and thank you so much again for the opportunity. Thanks so much. That was um, really compelling and we're so glad to hear that you're you're doing well, um, not rounding up or rounding down. Right. Um, so thank you for sharing that story with us. I'm going to kick things off just with a couple of questions to get us going. And then I've already got one in the chat, but a reminder um, to those of you who are listening in to please post your questions in the chat and I'll read them off. Um, so you hit on a lot of ethical concepts and you did a great job, right? For someone who's, you know, doesn't build themselves as an, as an ethicist kind of highlighting these, these, um, these issues, right? So you've talked about hope, right? Um, and, you know, how helpful it's been in your context, but there's also kind of a concept of false hope um, and, and maybe, you know, the concerns that, um, you know, people who are treating patients might have about um, instilling in them false hope and how people might choose to spend the time that they have remaining. Um, so that's one kind of uh, theme that I um, noticed in your talk. 
you've, I, I think, identified exactly correctly that self-experimentation is um, complicated. Uh, a history of self-experimentation kind of in the earlier days of human subjects research was kind of a, a signal um, that you took your work seriously enough to try it out on yourself and your family members first. Um, and then, you know, this idea about trying um, drugs that have been developed in other contexts, right? So, um, and, and the challenge um, that that creates with regard to um, off-label use versus putting things through, um, you know, a, a rigorous trial. And then um, underlying all of this, I think, is the important element of um, being in a privileged position, right? And having medical training or having access to, you know, a, a leader at NIH or, you know, having all of these opportunities. And so um, how can we translate that kind of privilege across other rare diseases and, and you know, not rare diseases, but let me, um, I said I would ask a question. So let me, let me ask a question, which is um, what you've taken away given your work with regard to COVID and um, rare diseases with regard to trial design. So in, in terms of research ethics, um, there have been claims earlier in the pandemic, at least that, you know, we've got these patients who are dying. And so we should just try to treat them with what we think might work and that we can't afford to put people in trials. And that tune I think has changed the farther along we've gotten and realized how difficult it is to actually figure out what works unless we do trials. And so maybe you could talk about that from the perspective of rare disease patients who don't have other clinical options and have really dire prospects. How does it feel to be offered a placebo control and a randomized design? Yeah, th these are such good questions. And, and I, I should have started my talk off by saying that I think my, my talk is going to probably present more questions than answers because I, I don't have uh, ethical frameworks to work within to try to, to put them into, um, but hopefully um, it provided some, some fruitful thoughts. Um, so I think that uh, to answer your question, I think that I, I've learned that, that so much of trial design and some of these questions are really dependent on that particular disease. So for example, in Castleman disease, um, there was a randomized control trial that was done and the placebo group had a 0% benefit. Um, there have been natural history studies that showed that no patients with Castleman disease have ever improved without some sort of therapy. And so when you have that historical context, you can do open label studies that can, where you just only give the drug to people. And if they get better, you can use the historical data to assume that they wouldn't have gotten better if they had just been given placebo. And so you can do open label studies to get a sense for what looks effective um, because the natural history is that no one benefits. Um, COVID is the opposite. Nearly everyone gets better from SARS-CoV-2 infection, regardless of whether you give them hydroxychloroquine, dexamethasone, or Skittles. It doesn't matter what you give them, the majority are going to get better. So if you do these sort of observational retrospective studies and you say 98% of people got better, that sounds awesome. Um, but you really don't know what that means because you didn't have a, a control group that you randomized patients into. And so I think that um, in, in, in COVID, so now we get specific with COVID, um, I don't think that anyone can make any sense of saying one drug's better than another unless there's been a randomized control trial done just because the natural history is just that people get better, thankfully. It's that small fraction that die that we have to figure out what's gonna work for them. And we won't figure it out unless we do um, rigorous RCTs. Great, thank you. I've got a couple of questions in the chat, so let me go to those. The first is from Sophia Zilber who asks, What's the best way to raise awareness regarding things such as patient registries for a rare disease where these efforts could clearly be improved, but there isn't a patient advocacy group or others who might be interested in joining that discussion? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that in the rare disease space, you really need to have a strong patient advocacy group. It's very hard to be a rare disease researcher or a rare disease physician or a rare disease patient and really generate momentum and progress unless you have that sort of rare disease group or organization that can serve as kind of the glue between all parts. And so I, I think that it's it's very, it can be done and certainly researchers have done it, but but boy, do, do I think it's it's critical to have um, a really strong research uh, research organization um, that can help to advocate for um, for registries. And, and I think recognizing that um, 
uh, that it's really hard to, to make too much noise in the Raiders E space and get the word out um, that well. It, it's, a really, it's really hard to do, um, but, uh, but having an advocacy organization is gonna make it a lot easier because people are gonna come to the advocacy organization instead of, if you've got a register, you've got to find people. But if you have an advocacy organization, then people are gonna come to the organization and they can learn about your registry. Great, okay, so now we have some ideas for you. Um, Gaurav Gupta asks, have you looked into the use of over-the-counter anti-inflammatory drugs for short-term treatment of cytokine storms? In, so it's a good question. We, we have not. Um, I have to say that uh, in the context of Castleman disease, um, we have a lot of anecdotal data. And like, like I said, no one gets better if they don't get some sort of definitive therapy. And so um, it's at least a little bit easier to, to kind of tease apart from observational data. Observational data suggests that there, that there isn't, at least in the setting of IMCD. Um, but I think that COVID, um, uh, we're likely to continue a drug like colchicine, which isn't over the counter, but if it didn't have um, uh, one or two notable side effects, it probably could be an over the counter um, drug. So and that seems to be effective or maybe effective at least more so in the inpatient than the outpatient setting. So I think that there that we probably will find that there are some over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, but the key in COVID is timing. So early on in a disease course, you don't want to be suppressing inflammation at all. In fact, you actually want to boost inflammation with drugs like inhaled interferon. But once patients transition into needing supplemental oxygen and hospitalization, that's when we need to start suppressing the immune response. Okay, um, just a reminder, if anybody else has questions, I have a few more, so, oh, here's one. Um, okay, so Anna Wexler um, says, excellent talk. Curious if you get questions from non-physician patients who want to self-experiment with treatment for their own rare disease, and how do you respond to them? Yeah, no, I, I definitely do. And I think that um, that's why it's so important to have these sort of discussions around the, the challenges um, and, and, and the, yeah. So, so I do. And, um, and I always share kind of the approach that I went through and I, and I share that it wasn't something I did on my own. Um, the term self-experimentation seems, sounds like it's really on your own. Um, but, but in my case, it really wasn't on my own. It was, um, I had scientific collaborators who were reviewing my data. I had, um, my doctor who was looking at the data afterwards and it was, it was certainly a team effort. And so I do try to encourage that, that it, it you know, it wasn't just you know me by myself, and that it really was a team. And um, and a lot of times, drug repurposing and, and off-label use happens in rare diseases. And so this this isn't this isn't a, a total exception. There's a lot of this. The challenge is, is that there are very few incentives in place to systematically determine what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question uh, that's completely unfair for you to answer in in, in only two minutes, um, but. How would you kind of advise um, other patients like yourself or in, in your physician's role patient um, deciding, you know, how to spend the time that they have left, right? If, if they're facing a life-threatening disease, um, yes. at what point do you say, okay, now is the time to, you know, focus on the time you have left with your family versus to continue pushing, fighting, calling everybody you can get your, yep. you know, get on your phone, that kind of advice. It's a good question. I think all I can say is from, from my experiences, both with my illness and then also with my mom, um, our approach with my mom was very much like, this is an awful disease. No one's ever lived more than a few years with her type of brain cancer. So we're going to take you to the right doctors. And then we're just going to like enjoy and squeeze every moment out of life that we can. Um, and in my case, we took the, the opposite approach, which was, you know, I'm going to go to the right doctor, but um, I'm going to spend most of my time these next few months, which might be my last few months, just like in the lab all the time, reading papers in the data, analyzing the data. And, and, and it felt like it was, um, I think, two reasons why I made that decision. One part is that there, I felt like there was some hope because there were some people who benefited from IL-6 blockade and were doing well, which made me feel like even though I wasn't benefiting from IL-6 blockade, like maybe I could just find that drug and I could do well like them. Whereas with glioblastoma, the type that my mom had, there's just no one that's ever done, done well. And so I think this gets to this like hope, re real hope, not like I, I had hope, even though I shouldn't have had hope when my mom was, you know, objectively, there was no hope, but I still was hopeful, maybe false hope. Um, whereas in my case, I had this little bit of hope because I'd seen other people with my same disease that, that could have, have, have good outcomes. And I think part of it also was like, you know, I kind of want to go out swinging um, and, you know, do what I can know that I, I kind of tried everything that I could. But 
I think every patient's going to fall somewhere in that spectrum. And I, and I think it's really a function of the person, but also a function of the disease in, in major part. Great. Well, I think that's a really perfect um, note on which to end. Thanks so much for sharing your really um, compelling story with us um, and continued good health and best wishes in all your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.